What is up guys, Blue Spooky here with the Wednesday 2 hour mega mix. That is 2 hours of new true scary stories to this channel, as much as I am able to track. If you guys enjoy this long video, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. Doing all of those ensures I can keep making daily videos for a long time to come, especially these longer ones. If you guys have any thoughts about the stories in this video, please be sure to leave them in the comments below. As one of my favorite parts about doing this is reading your guys' comments, even if I don't always get the chance to reply to them. Without further ado though guys, I will let you enjoy the next two hours of True Scary Stories, and I will see you again at the end of the video. Thanks for watching. This happened last summer. I was driving home from work one night. I often work all kinds of different hours, and on this night in particular, I had worked very late. I left at probably about 2.30 in the morning, and the drive back home took about 20 minutes or so. As you can imagine, by this time of night, the roads were dead quiet. After getting off the highway about five minutes into the drive, I didn't see any other cars for quite a long time. I remember though that as I came around another bend, a very short time later, I saw headlights emerge behind me. I could tell that whatever this was, it was a much larger vehicle, maybe a truck of some sort. I didn't really think too much of it though. I kept driving down the road and eventually had to turn. I remember that as I made this turn, the vehicle behind me did as well. Not only did it turn in with me, it took this opportunity to increase its speed, and now the vehicle was much closer to me than before. We were the only two vehicles out on the road at this time. As it got closer to me, I started to hear a kind of music. I remember that after a couple of minutes, I rolled my window down slightly, and that's when I realized that this truck behind me appeared to be an ice cream truck. It was playing the ice cream truck music. This really seemed strange to me. Why would there be an ice cream truck out driving at almost 3 o'clock in the morning? And playing the music as well. I kept going with the truck right on my ass. Eventually, I had to turn again, and when I did, the truck still followed me. After going around the turn, I was able to confirm that it was, in fact, an ice cream truck. The closer I got to my home, the more and more confused I became. The truck ended up following me all the way to my street. I went down my street and pulled into my driveway. The truck did not pull in after me, but instead kept going a little farther, then stopped right in the middle of the street, sort of in front of my home. I quickly got out of my car and went inside. After I got in the house, I looked out the window. The ice cream truck was still there, just sitting right in the middle of the road. I could hear the music playing, just barely. I watched the truck stay there for about five minutes. I was about to call the police on it. It was so suspicious. Right as I was about to do so, though, it just started driving away. I was glad to see it gone now. I thought that would be the end of it. However, it was not. The next night, I didn't have to work so late, so I wasn't followed home or anything. I was able to be in bed by midnight. However, I remember after laying down and closing my eyes, before I could fall asleep, I heard this strange sound coming from outside. I could just barely make it out, and that's when I realized it was the music from the ice cream truck. I went over to my window and looked outside, and there I saw the very same vehicle slowly driving down the street. It was moving at 5 miles per hour or less. I couldn't believe it. Whoever this guy was, he came back. I watched the truck very slowly drive out of sight. It took me a while to fall asleep after that but the truck did not return after. In fact, after that, I never saw or heard of it again. Looking back, it's very confusing to me. Why was there an ice cream truck driving around on quiet roads at 3 o'clock in the morning? 
Why did it follow me to my house and come back the very next night? And why did they never show up again after? I still don't have any answers, but I'm glad I never saw it again after that. In high school, I would earn some extra money over the summers by house-sitting for my aunt and uncle. They were fairly rich, so they took a lot of vacations. They had gone away on a short weekend trip, so I would be house-sitting for them the entire weekend. My aunt and uncle owned a couple of cats, so they always requested I stay overnight. I really didn't mind it, since they had a really nice house anyway. This particular Saturday night... It was my friend Tyler's birthday. Our friend group went out for dinner that evening, and we all wanted to hang out more afterwards. I offered up my aunt and uncle's home as a place where we could hang out for the rest of the night. Many people wanted to drink and party a bit, and we couldn't do it at anybody else's home due to their parents being home. It was a pretty normal night. We played many card games and drinking games together and enjoyed celebrating Tyler's birthday. We wrapped up at close to 2 a.m. and everybody began leaving. There were enough people who stayed sober so that everyone had a ride home and nobody needed to crash at my aunt and uncle's house for the night. I said goodbye to everyone and headed back into the kitchen to clean up some of the cans and glasses. It felt like it had been barely three or four minutes since everybody had left, when the doorbell suddenly rang. I assumed that one of my friends must have forgotten something important, so I went to answer the door without thinking very much about it. I threw open the door and was surprised to find nobody there. I was pretty drunk at this point and didn't think too much of it, thinking my friends must be playing a prank on me. Into the night's darkness, I yelled out, Real funny, guys. Go home already. I went back inside and went to sleep on the couch. Later that night, I was woken up to the sound of the doorbell being rung multiple times in a row. Whoever it was was ringing it very quickly. I didn't know what time it was, but I was pretty angry at being woken up. I had a feeling it most likely was not my friends ringing the doorbell this time. I didn't open the door. I peeked out the front window through the curtains. My aunt and uncle's house was in a nicer part of town, where there was a lot of space for yards and not many street lights. I couldn't really see anybody through the window because of how dark it was. I didn't call the cops because there was a possibility it could have been my friends. I figured I'd better not call anyone just in case. I went back to sleep and didn't have any more problems for the rest of the night. The next morning, I texted my group chat of my friends and asked them if they had played a prank on me last night with that whole ringing the doorbell business. They all swore that they had not, as they'd all gone home and went to bed. After I cleaned up the rest of the mess from the night before, I opened the front door to leave. At that point, I saw a piece of paper taped to the door. It was a note that said, if you want a really fun night, why don't you leave the door unlocked next time? To me, the whole situation seemed more like a weird messed up prank by someone, but either way, it was real creepy. I told my aunt and uncle about that night once they returned, and also asked not to stay overnight when I house-sit for them in the future. They ended up installing a ring doorbell camera after that, and have not had any problems since that night. I still feel uneasy sometimes if I'm house-sitting for them, and I'm there while it's dark out. This happened when I was in high school. It was my sophomore year, and this was during the first semester. I remember that I was sitting in my history class, and we were watching a documentary... And that's what we did most of the time in that class, really. Right in the middle of it, the door to the classroom opened, and this random student walked in and said my name. She was holding what appeared to be a pass in her hand, so I got up from my desk and walked over to her. When I took the pass from her, it was for me to go to the library. I was confused at first. I had no clue as to why I'd been asked to go there. 
I had not been expecting to get any kind of pass at all that day. I showed the pass to my teacher, and he said I could go. I left the classroom and headed out into the hallway. Now, class was about halfway over at this point. The library was basically on the complete other end of the school and was usually very quiet. I remember walking there, and maybe two or three minutes into the journey, I heard over the school speakers that we were currently in a lockdown. Might when I heard that, I wasn't sure what to do. Should I try to continue on to the library, or should I run back to my history classroom? It would take a couple of minutes either way. I decided to continue on to the library. As I was walking about 30 seconds later, I saw a classroom. I knew that one of my friends was in that class. It was also a teacher I had later on in the day anyway, so I figured I would stop and go to that classroom. When I went to the door, I knocked on it, and the teacher was quick to open the door and let me in. I joined the class and huddling toward the back corner of the room. The lights were all off, and things were really quiet for the most part. There was a little bit of whispering, and nobody seemed to know what this lockdown was about. About 15 minutes later, there was another knock on the classroom door. I think most of us in the room got nervous when we heard it. The teacher went to the door and opened it up soon after. I heard the voice of our vice principal and heard my name getting called. I was very surprised and confused. I got up and walked over to the teacher and vice principal. She told me that I was not in trouble, but I had to go to the office right now. At this point, even though I had been told I was in no trouble, I was still pretty nervous as to what this was all about. We went back to the offices, where the principal was. A short time later, the lockdown was ended. When I went into the office, I was told some shocking news. Apparently, there was a man inside the school who did not work there, and he was the reason for the lockdown. The pass I had received for the library was not a real pass. Somehow the man had walked right into the school, wearing somewhat professional clothing. I guess he blended in enough that most people assumed he was a sub or something. He found a random kid walking down the hallway, who happened to be a teacher's aide, and asked her to deliver the pass specifically to me. He had handwritten the note himself, for me to go to the library, after the kid delivered it. The man was hiding inside the library waiting for me. What his intentions could have possibly been, or even how he knew me, I have no idea. After I was told about this and asked a bunch of other questions, eventually, after almost an hour, I was picked up by my mother and brought home. The man had been caught by the police after they found him in the library. I had never seen the guy before. I had no idea what he was doing, but apparently he must have known a lot about me if he knew my name and all that stuff. It still gives me the creeps just thinking about it. This story takes place back when I used to drive a delivery truck for UPS. It was a couple of years ago. The house deliveries were normally pretty easy, but oftentimes I would have to enter apartment buildings. A lot of times, there would be a desk receptionist in a mailbox area, and I could just leave the package with them. Every so often, though, I would have to bring the package directly to someone's door, especially if it was something that couldn't fit in their mailbox. There was this one particular delivery where I had to bring a package up to someone's door. It was an older apartment building with no elevator. I walked up the stairs with my package to the fourth floor and went to the room number. Thankfully, I had found it on the directory down on the first floor. As I was setting the package down, the door opened. I stood back, deciding I would just hand the person their package directly. The man who had opened the door had on a muscle shirt with holes in it, tidy whities and nothing else. I was considerably perplexed by the image that was in front of me. To avoid staring at this nearly naked man, I averted my gaze into his apartment. The scene that was before me was quite disturbing. There were multiple bottles of beer, as well as wine on the living room table. 
In the dimly lit room, I saw what appeared to be a woman who was naked and sleeping. The man, who clearly saw I was staring into his apartment for a quick second, hurriedly slammed the door shut in my face. I wasn't quite sure what had just happened. During the long walk back down the stairs to my truck, I was pondering what exactly was going on in that apartment. To me, it looked like something potentially wrong was going on, but there was also a possibility it was the man's wife who was passed out or something. I was still thinking about the scenario when I got into my truck and prepared to drive away. As I was pulling away from the apartment building, I saw the same man who I'd just given the package to. He was now outside the front doors of the building, crouched down next to a bush and hiding. He wasn't doing a very good job of it though. That further added to my suspicion so much so that once I pulled away, I called the police to let them know what I had seen. The police indeed went to the man's apartment and managed to stop a potential case of a woman having been kidnapped and drugged. I suppose the man had followed me out of the building to see if I would try to tell anyone what I had seen. I can't imagine what the man would have said or even done to me if I had decided to call the cops as I was still walking out of the building. That was by far the eeriest situation that I've ever been a part of while I was a UPS driver. Though I used to go hiking here and there, I went one time about a year ago on this trail that went into the middle of the woods. The area that I live in is a little out in the country, and there's a lot of good places to hike there. I was at this one hiking trail, and this was my first time at this one in particular. I started on the trail, and things were pretty fine. There seemed to be nobody else there at all. The trail was very long, but I say that because when I arrived, there were no cars in the parking lot, and as I started hiking, I did not see or hear anybody either. I went along the trail for about 30 minutes, and by that time I had reached a portion that was in the middle of really thick woods on both sides. As I was walking down the path, I remember hearing a noise just up ahead of me, inside the woods somewhere. I stopped to look. Of course, I figured it was probably an animal of some kind. Moments later though, instead of an animal, a man appeared on the path. This man had very long straight hair and a notable mustache. He walked out to the middle of the path and sort of faced me, but didn't seem to be actually looking at me. He just stood there. I continued to stand where I was too. After the man made no attempts to move for a few moments, I actually thought about just turning around and going back. Something about this guy just seemed really weird to me. I thought, though, that maybe I should just keep going and walk right past the guy. I approached the man who was still standing, right in the center of the path. His eyes refocused, and he started to look at me as I got closer. He was just staring. When I got real close to him, I waved and said hello to the man. The man did not say hi back to me or react at all. When I reached where he was, I was going to go around him, but he stepped in front of me to block me. The man asked me where I was going, and I said that I was just walking on the trail. Right after I heard the man speaking, I knew something was wrong with him. Maybe he was on drugs of some kind or something. He was definitely acting pretty sketchy. The man then insisted that I follow him somewhere. Obviously, I said no thanks. At that point, I decided maybe it would be best to just walk back. I said I really had to get going. The man said okay. I turned around and started to walk back, and the man just continued to stand in the same spot for a while. I then heard some more noises in the woods on the trail. I turned around and saw the man walking back into the woods. I was glad to be getting away from this guy. He just seemed very, very strange. I didn't know what his goal was or what he could be doing. I was just going to walk back to my car in the parking lot. A couple of minutes later, I heard another noise far behind me on the trail. I turned around and noticed the man was now on the trail behind me. He was a ways back, 
but I saw he was now carrying what looked to be a large stick of some kind. I tried to walk a little bit faster and kept going. As I was doing so, I did my best to ignore the man. I could still hear him walking a ways back, so I would know if he was getting closer. About five minutes later, the man was still following me on the trail behind me. Shortly after, I stopped hearing him, and I felt a little bit better. I thought he must have finally gone somewhere else. I began to hear him again a few minutes later, though. He was still following me. The longer this went on, the more nervous I became. Without even really trying, I was now walking very fast. It seemed like the man was keeping perfect pace with me, though, not getting any closer or farther. This continued for what felt like a very long time. At last, I could see the beginning of the trail where the parking lot was. I got out my keys as I approached, and when I reached the parking lot, I looked back again. The man was still there, now clearly gaining on me. I quickly unlocked my car and got inside, then locked it back up. As I was driving away, I looked back and saw the man reach the parking lot. He just went to the middle of it and watched me drive away. I was really glad to be getting the hell out of there. I ended up reporting the guy for following me and his sketchy behavior. I certainly didn't want another hiker to encounter him after that experience. Since then, I've not been back to that trail. I don't really know who the man was or how he even got to the park, nor what he was doing. It was really strange for him to follow me all that distance. For context, I live in the UK, and this happened when I was around 9 years old. Obviously, this is a true encounter. My friend had come over, and we decided to go to a sweet shop, which was a few minutes walk away from my house. We picked up some sweets and went to the cashier. Whilst we were in the queue, I remember my friend saying, Thank God we're alone to play peacefully at home. She meant alone, as in the fact that this time her mom didn't send her younger sister who would annoy us to play with us. Looking back, though, I think a man in there must have heard that and thought that we were home alone entirely. Skip to when we were about to pay. This older-looking man that looked to be in his 40s offered to pay for us. We politely refused, but upon his insistence, we couldn't really refuse any longer. We didn't know any better as little girls, and he was causing a bit of a scene, so we accepted. I actually remember being somewhat happy that I'd saved some of my pocket money. We were leaving the shop now, and saw the man climb into a car which had other men inside. He even waved at us as we were leaving. We were walking home, when we noticed his car behind us. We didn't really give it much thought, until he slowed down to match our pace, and rolled his window down. He told us that he was on a call with my dad, who had told him to pick us up and drop us off at home. We were immediately suspicious. I didn't know this random man. Why would my dad call him and tell him to drop us off, when he didn't even know we'd left home because he was at work? We said no, to which he said, I paid for your sweets, you gotta pay me back. We started walking faster. It was daytime, so I don't think he could have forced us in. I remember it was quite a sunny day, and so more people than usual were in the park that was within eyes distance away from us. Forcing us in would mean too much noise and attention. Within a few minutes, we got home, thankfully without further incident. Moments later, though, we heard the doorbell begin ringing. My mom was at home. She answered the door, only to find that very same man outside. The man was obviously startled to see my mother there and began to stutter and panic. Uh, do, do you need help with the garden, ma'am? I'm a garden cleaner. My mom declined. At first, we didn't tell her about what had happened. We were too scared, but we did later. She did report this to the police, but I don't know what happened next. Now, I wonder what if we were home alone? What if we had opened the door? And worse, what if we'd actually gotten into that man's car?
Once in high school, I was babysitting a teacher's kids with my ex. The parents were super late, so we decided to stay in the living room, even though the TV and such was downstairs. We wanted to leave as soon as they got back. They lived in this huge house overlooking the woods, and this little pond area, so they had big windows installed throughout the home. At about 12.30, I started getting a bit annoyed. I gave the parents a call, and they said they were on their way back home. At this point, the huge windows were really starting to freak me out, but whatever. I was with my boyfriend, and the parents were on their way anyway. A few minutes later, we heard the doorknob to the garage start to jiggle. We thought it was the parents letting themselves in at first, but it continued to jiggle for 30 whole seconds, then stopped altogether. I started freaking out and walked toward the kitchen where the door was. I glanced out through the window that overlooked the deck. I'll never forget it. There was a strobe light of some kind on, and a man was standing directly in front of it so he was silhouetted. He was just standing there. I started panicking, basically, and the light stopped blinking. My heart had pretty much stopped in place. I have no idea what the man did after that, because I ran away to call the parents. They were still 20 minutes away, so it really couldn't have been them. When I told them about what happened when they arrived, they informed me that their war vet neighbor would apparently wander the property at night and may have viewed me in particular as a threat for some reason. Why they didn't tell me that beforehand or tell him that we were going to be there, I'll never know. But hey, I got paid. Not enough to ever go back to that house again, certainly. I live in a small cul-de-sac in the middle of nowhere. The next nearest neighborhood is over four miles away. One night, a few years ago, we got over a foot and a half of snow overnight. So far from the main roads and on the weekend, I knew our roads would remain unplowed for quite some time. I went to my outback deck door to admire the snow-draped trees and still heavily falling flurries. That was when I noticed footprints leading to my door, then turning around and leaving. I looked and saw that they'd come from my neighbor's side and thought that maybe one of their more delinquent kids was playing a joke as my sledding tube on the railing had been popped. I decided I'd wait till later, as it was early to call their parents. I went on Facebook, and after scrolling for a bit, I noticed one of my neighbors closer to the entrance posted, Did someone knock for me or something at my back door? I immediately called her up and told her I had an idea. I called the first house on the entrance and told him what was going on. He went and checked, and sure enough they were there too. Everyone started calling everyone else. I called the family at the far end, and they told me there were no footsteps there. I then got a call from my next door neighbor. She called the woman that lived next to the end house. That woman said footprints were leading to her door as well, but this time there were none that led away. We had already called the police by this point. We called them back and said it was an emergency now. They told us the roads were all still unplowed and they couldn't send a plow truck to clear the way, as they were a privately owned company. The woman was losing it, so one of the husbands, a huge bear of a man from across the road, texted her to say he was coming over. He came, and she left her house to meet up with him. We all got together and tried to think up a plan. We put up one guy's live feed motion recording hunting cameras, facing all the exits. Nothing had come out. Around 7 p.m., a plow truck finally came, as well as three cop cars. The couple the woman was staying with and her herself went back to her home. They stood in the doorway as the police searched, and apparently they found nothing. She begged them to keep looking, so they did. Two of the cops went into the basement again. This time, only one of them came up, though. He took her to a side room, and we could hear her hysterical crying. Me and a few of the other guys started toward the door when several police came to speak to us. They told us they'd found someone 
hiding under a cover opening in the stairwell. The woman whose home it was didn't even know that area existed. A few minutes later, a scruffy man, screaming and kicking, was dragged out in cuffs and led away. In his little camp out, they found blankets that she'd just cleaned and put away. They had been put away in the room right next to hers. She stayed in other people's houses for a long time before going back there, and even then she refused to stay alone. She sold the house the very next summer. The man that was inside her home turned out to be a thrill-seeking junkie who was on probation for attacking multiple people including a family member. The cops told us they feel like he didn't want to stay at his apartment after attacking his roommate. He stole his roommate's car from the county over and got stuck on our unplowed roads while driving away. We were called as witnesses in the case. He had taken some electronics from her basement. Couldn't get him on that though since he never left with the stuff. It was about four months of court cases and eventually the man was arrested. That is why you always make sure to lock your doors, no matter how close your community is nor how rural you are. My husband and I had just moved into a new home. We had just moved in from out of state and had only been living there about a week or so. We had met a couple of the neighbors but still didn't really know anybody all too well. One night, my husband was driving home late at night after picking up some fast food for us. Once he was inside, he told me he swore he had just seen somebody running away from the side of our home. We decided just to make sure that all the doors and windows were locked for the night. We'd check out the area by the side of the house in the morning. The next morning, we went to the side of the home, and nothing was really super noticeable. My husband did notice one detail, though. There was a small, half-dead patch of grass under our bedroom window. The grass there was squished and laying down, as if someone had been standing right there. This led us to believe that someone had been standing right under our window, but they would have had to have done it fairly often since the grass in that area was different. There was also the possibility that an animal like a rabbit or something enjoyed laying in that spot under our bedroom window. We weren't entirely sure what to make of it. That very same night, though, I woke up in the middle of the night to a soft clicking sound coming from outside our bedroom window. We had shades over this window, and they were currently closed so I wasn't able to see anything unless I went over there and peeked out through them directly. I quietly woke my husband, and we sat there in silence, listening in to the noise. After a few minutes, my husband went over to the window and peeked out through the blinds. The noise had stopped as soon as he had gotten out of bed, and he informed me that nothing was there. This led us to conclude that whoever was out there could somehow see through some part of our blinds and leave the area before being caught. The very next night, the very next night, we were both already on edge about the situation. We woke up to the exact same strange clicking noise again. My husband went to peek through the blinds to see nobody there. In our eyes, it was hard for us to imagine the problem being some sort of animal. We knew that we had what appeared to be a window creeper on our hands. We ended up moving out of that house within the next two weeks. We didn't think the area was a good fit for us. The continued problem with this window creeper only made the decision to move that much easier. For the rest of our time living in that house, we lived in the basement where there were no windows at all. As for the clicking noise under the windows at night, we weren't sure... Assuming the worst, it may have been a creepy pervert who was taking pictures of us with a camera somehow through the shades, or potentially something else, like somebody trying to gain entrance through the window. Either way, it was a disturbing few nights, and I'm glad that we ended up moving away.
I have a really bizarre story to tell. It happened a few months back. There was this wedding coming up that I was going to with my wife. We were guests and I had to go to a tailor for my suit. Obviously, I had no idea what tailor I was supposed to go to. I remember my wife told me that she knew of one that her family had been going to for years, and that was fine with me. The next evening after work, I stopped by their place. On this particular day, I was working very late, which is something that did occasionally happen. It was about 8pm or so, and completely dark outside. I put in the address to the tailors and followed it. When I arrived, I found myself in the parking lot of an old run-down looking mall. There were hardly any other vehicles in the entire lot. At first, I thought this had to be a mistake of some kind, but then I looked at the map again. It showed that the tailor was apparently inside the mall. I was already thinking of how I was going to be teasing my wife for having me stop at this abandoned looking place. It did say they were open though, so I got out of my car and walked inside. When I first arrived in the mall, it was a very strange feeling. The place was literally 90% abandoned. There were hardly any lights on even. There were countless closed up stores, most of them completely empty. A few still had their signs up and some things inside. As you could probably guess, there was not even one other single person in sight. I was even wondering myself if I was supposed to be here. I started wandering the hallways looking for the tailor's shop. As I was walking, I remember I passed by this one store that looked to be a clothing store. At least, that's what it used to be. This store was closed. Looked like it had only been closed for maybe the past year or so. I could still see there was some merchandise inside. It was messy and stuff, but I also noticed the door to this particular store was propped open. I figured maybe they were in the process of clearing it out or something. As I was looking and passing by, I saw that someone was actually inside this store. It was a man who was wearing jeans and a hooded sweatshirt. I remember that he was passing by the giant window. He looked over and saw me. Then, after looking in my direction, he quickly turned and literally ran out of my view. I was now thinking that obviously this guy was not supposed to be in there. What was he doing? I didn't know. I didn't really care either. I kept walking and just tried to ignore it. I turned and went down another hallway that was mostly abandoned as well. Finally, at the end of this, there was one sign lit up and in working order. It said Taylor. I walked to the end and entered that store. It was, in fact, open and in business. Honestly, I really couldn't believe it. I went inside and got all my measurements and stuff. I was in the store for about 10 to 15 minutes. Having done my business, I left. It was now time to walk back through the eerily quiet mall to leave. I went down the first hallway and turned into the next one. Now I was in the main hallway that led out to the parking lot. I remember as I was passing by the clothing store again, I saw the door was still propped open. The guy who I had seen before was now back, but this time he was looking right at me from the other side of the window. I thought it was weird how he was just staring at me, but I ignored it and passed him by. As soon as I passed by the store though, I heard the door shoot open and footsteps starting to follow me. I didn't look back, but as I kept going I heard the footsteps moving in my direction. I didn't know what this guy could possibly have as a reason for following me. I didn't recognize him, and he didn't say anything to me. I didn't say anything to him either. I kept walking and soon reached the exit doors. The man was moving probably 30 to 40 feet behind me. When I was going through the doors, it sounded like the man behind me started to speed up. After I got outside, I looked back for a second. I saw the man fling the doors open at a blazing speed. Right after seeing that, I started sprinting for my car. I heard the man behind me running as well. I went as fast as I could, and luckily I have some decent speed. 
When I reached my car, I stopped, got out my keys as fast as possible, and hit unlock over and over. I grabbed the door and opened it, and got inside. Immediately after I managed to get the door locked, the man reached it. He reached my door and tried to yank it open. I was starting my engine, and he began to slam his fists on the window. Fortunately, I was able to drive off without the window breaking. I left and called security when I got on the road. I reported what happened, and was honestly very confused myself. What had even taken place here? I went home and told my wife all about the event. Looking back, I really don't know why that man went after me. I'm guessing he was trying to rob me and maybe was trying to steal from the abandoned store as well. Since this happened, I've joked with my wife quite a bit about how she sent me to that abandoned mall to get robbed. I did return to the mall to go to the tailor again, but this time I went much earlier in the day. That experience was just fine. This remains one of the scariest memories in my life. My friends from college and I tried to stay as close as possible after we graduated from school. One of the ways that we would do this is by all of us taking a week off during the summer or fall and going on a camping road trip together. Last year, we had planned together and decided to go camping in the mountains of Colorado toward the end of summer or so. Towards the end of summer... Once our flight landed, we purchased our rental car, and we headed off to the mountains for some camping. The second night that we were out there, we found a nice small camping area with individual lots. The lots were distanced from each other well enough where it felt like our own individual campground, especially with all the trees surrounding us. We had picked a lot close to the small creek, which was flowing nearby. We did that so we could wash off after a long day of hiking. We set up our campsite while it was still light out that evening, so we wouldn't have to set everything up after dark. Once everything had been finished, we headed to a restaurant in the closest town for some dinner. We arrived back to the campsite after dark, and were surprised to see that our tent flap was open, and our stuff had been moved around outside. There was nobody in the clearing of our campsite, but somebody had clearly gone through our things. It was a disturbing scene for sure, but we proceeded with our camping. It was time to get some sleep soon. We grabbed our towels and shampoo and walked the short five-minute walk to the stream to wash off in the water. It was very cold, but quite refreshing in a way. It wasn't until after we had exited the stream and were drying ourselves off with towels on the river bank that I noticed something across the stream on the opposite bank. There was 100% somebody watching us. Not wanting to alarm my friends, and also not wanting to let the figure on the other side of the stream know that I'd seen them, I suggested we go back to camp. On the walk back to our campsite, I briefly explained to my friends that I had seen someone across the stream from us in the woods. Between that and the incident of somebody rummaging through our tent while we were gone, it was decided that we would sleep in the car tonight. It was already hard enough to sleep and get comfortable in the car. The added anxiety about the person I had seen by the stream didn't exactly help out. The whole night, I kept glancing out the windows, checking to see if I would find anybody lurking nearby in the moonlight. At some point in the middle of the night, I glanced outside the car window, and my worst fears were confirmed as true. There was a figure crouching down by the entrance of our tent, slowly unzipping it. I watched in horror as the person quickly discovered there was nobody inside. They immediately turned their head towards our car. The figure then slowly disappeared around the back of our tent and began to crawl closer to the vehicle. I frantically woke my friends up at the same time while reaching into the driver's seat to honk the horn. The honking of the horn was effective. We watched as the figure got up from the ground and left the campsite, disappearing into the woods. 
What will always stick with me about that night is how the figure we saw didn't run away frightened after being discovered. They just calmly stood up and walked away from us out into the woods, not bothered at all by the fact we had seen them. Nobody got any more sleep that night in the car. We stayed up and alert. Paranoid, the figure would attempt to return. We didn't have any more problems for the last couple hours of the night until it started getting light out. We had planned on staying at this camping location for two nights, but needless to say, we did not stay there for the second one. We continued the rest of our camping trip moving to a different campsite, and thankfully there were no more issues with the rest of the trip. That night will be vivid in my memory for a long time. This took place last summer. I was at home by myself one evening. I lived with my husband, but he was away at a sports game with one of his friends. Because of that, I knew he would be gone until much later. It was a pretty normal night, probably sometime around 9pm or so. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, the power cut out and everything went black. I found this really strange. It was not storming outside whatsoever, so I didn't know why this would happen. I knew we had paid the electric bill like always, so at that point I jumped onto my phone. I went onto the app of our electric company and looked to see if there were any reported outages in the area. If there are, usually it will say the cause of it, and it will also say when the power should be restored. When I logged into the app, though, I didn't see any information about a current blackout. I was trying to figure out what was going on for minutes, but I didn't have any luck at all. As I was doing this, I heard the sound of glass breaking coming from the back of my home. It was very loud and alarming, especially because everything was so quiet and dark right now. I could only see from the light on my phone. I got up and used it to guide my way to the back side of the home. As I got closer, I heard some noises coming from near the back door area. When I finally got within view of the back door, I stopped. I saw the window had been smashed, and an arm was reaching its way inside trying to unlock the door. Somebody was trying to break in. I couldn't see who it was, but it really freaked me out. Instantly, I turned in the other direction and ran away. I went as fast as I could to the bedroom. It was hard to see where I was going, but I was able to make it there and get inside. When I got inside the bedroom, I closed the door behind me and locked it. Then, I went to the bedroom closet and hid inside. When I got there, I called the police on my phone. I said somebody had broken into my home, and because of how quiet it was, I heard the back door open while I was saying this. The man walked in. I didn't know who it was or what he looked like, but I gave the police as much information as I could. The thing that really mattered was that now officers were on their way to my home. I could hear the guy walking around inside for a few moments. When I got off the phone with the police, though, I didn't really hear him anymore. I listened closely, but I couldn't hear him making any sounds at all. I wasn't sure what was going on. Still, I didn't dare move or make a sound myself. I remained hidden inside the bedroom closet. I was afraid that at any moment, I would hear footsteps outside the door or hear the doorknobs start to turn. If this guy broke the back door window to get in... Who knows what he would do now that he was inside. He could break down the bedroom door in multiple ways despite it being locked. As time went by though, I still didn't hear anything. Within 10 minutes, the police had arrived. They made their way into the house through the back door and searched the entire premises. When they made it to the bedroom, I finally left my hiding place. However, the police never found the man. The window was smashed to the back door, and the back door had been left open. The guy was long gone. The police even searched around the neighborhood a little bit, but whoever had broken in had left and was nowhere to be seen. Inside the house, everything was perfectly fine. Nothing had been stolen or misplaced at all. 
Upon checking outside, the police found the power line to our house had been cut, probably by the man who broke in. Why he did this, I have no idea, but I'm sure it was no accident. I called my husband, and he came home right away. The police then left, after getting information about the incident. Since this has happened, we got the window replaced and also installed security cameras. Nothing else suspicious has happened since then. This took place about three weeks back. It was the morning time, and my girlfriend Alyssa and I were going on a day trip about two hours away. Shortly after we left, maybe about five minutes into the drive, Alyssa remembered something and asked me to stop. There was a Dollar Tree right off the road coming up, so I pulled off. We were in an area with quite a few stores, but I felt like Dollar Tree would be the fastest in and out. I pulled into the parking lot and parked right in front of the building. Alyssa said she would just run inside real quick and would be back right away. I stayed inside the car and kept it running while she went in. I was guessing she would be out within two to three minutes, seeing as she only had to get one thing. I sat there and just looked around the parking lot. It was a beautiful sunny day. It was a beautiful sunny day and things seemed to be pretty calm. However, within 30 seconds, I noticed the automatic doors of the Dollar Tree opening. A man walked out wearing a backwards baseball hat and started walking on the sidewalk out front of the store. He put a cigarette into his mouth and then looked over at me as he passed by my car. Instead of continuing to walk down the sidewalk, the man stopped and started to head over to me. I had a bad feeling when I saw this. I really didn't know what the man could possibly want. He went right up to my driver's side window. I rolled it down about halfway, and the man asked if I had some money for him, or if I could give him a ride. I told the guy I couldn't. I was in a real hurry. The man didn't respond, but tried to open my driver's door. Luckily, it was locked. Now, I wasn't sure what to do. I rolled my window back up, but it's not like I could just drive away and get out of there. Alyssa was still inside the store. I was hoping she would come out soon. The man stuck right by my driver's door and started banging on the window. I told the man to go away, but of course he did not. The man started getting real aggressive, calling me names and telling me to come out of the car. I tried to just ignore it. The man continued to punch and bang at my window. Luckily, it didn't break or anything. It was just after this that I saw the doors open to the Dollar Tree out of the corner of my eye. I looked over. Alyssa was walking out. She began walking to my car, but I saw the man finally leave, only to start going after her. I didn't know what he was planning to do. Was he going to ask her for money as well or do something worse? I didn't want him going anywhere near her. I opened my driver's door and left the car. I yelled at the man to come back. I may have called him some names as well. He stopped approaching Alyssa, who was about halfway to the car and now probably very confused. He turned around and began moving back over to me. The man looked angry, but at the same time happy, as if he was looking forward to fighting me. As he approached, I told Alyssa to get back in the car. I sprinted back around to my driver's door and got inside, while the man chased after me. Alyssa sprinted to the passenger side door and was able to get inside easily. After we both made it in, we locked our doors. The man was now directly in front of my car, about to reach the driver's side. I was able to lock it just in time. After the man failed to open the door, he started to repeatedly slam at my window. I quickly put the car into reverse, backed away, and left the parking lot. The man actually tried chasing after us on foot, but obviously we were able to outrun him easily. Alyssa asked me what on earth that was all about. I told her the whole story and she called the police, reporting the strange incident. We were told that an officer would go down to the Dollar Tree and look for the man. We just went right back on with our drive.
Looking back at that moment, we came extremely close to the man possibly trying to attack one of us. I feel lucky to have escaped. Sure, maybe I could have taken him in a fight, but that's not a situation I wanted to be in. Hopefully that man didn't bother anybody else. I had this 19-year-old kid with FAS living in my condo complex with his family. My parents were real drunks and he had no friends at all it seemed. One day, while I was on my balcony, we got to chatting and I invited him over to play some video games. It all went well and good and I told him we could maybe hang out again sometime. Well, he took that to mean every waking hour. For the next few weeks, he would call incessantly and wait until I got home. He'd just ring my doorbell over and over and over again, to the point where I couldn't go an hour without him bugging me. Even when it was one in the morning on a weekday, he would still ring my doorbell. Despite all the talks I had with him telling him to chill out a bit and to not contact me so constantly, he just refused to stop. Over the next month or so, it actually just got worse and worse until it reached a real breaking point. I said enough is enough and that he was no longer welcome to be around me. After that was the final incident, where the creepiness really kicked in to high gear. There was another 1am door knock, and like all the previous times before, I decided to just ignore it. I made sure my doors were locked and that all the lights remained off. When I got up in the morning to leave for work, I saw a mostly empty bottle of whiskey and a large knife embedded into my front step. I have no idea what he planned, or if it was even him who left those things there, but I'm pretty glad I didn't open the door to give him an earful about respecting a person's space that night. Being from the Navajo Nation, I've seen a lot of crazy shit. Anyone not from here is most likely not to believe me. I have stories about skinwalkers, Bigfoot, some type of winged beast. But I think the most creepy story of all I have is this story. This story takes place in the early 2000s when I was a teenager. My cousin had just had a baby and her husband was called out for a job that would take a couple of weeks. My cousin asked me if I would stay with her for the two weeks and help her with the baby and work around the house. I was there for a few days and everything was pretty uneventful until the middle of the second week. At night, we began to hear someone knocking on different sides of the trailer. Keep in mind the nearest neighbor was five miles away. This continued for three nights in a row. The fourth night is when things took a turn for the worst. The night started with the standard knocking, but it soon progressed to a weird scratching. Worried that someone was trying to break in, I summoned the courage to go out and confront whoever was messing with us. I only caught a shadow of whoever it was as it ran behind the trailer. I ran around yelling at them, You better run cause I'm gonna call the cops! Something to that extent. They were so fast I couldn't believe it. As I chased them around the front of the trailer, they ran through the clothesline. This is where it got even crazier. They ran to the utility post and began to climb up it, clutching something in their hands. Then they began to do the most eerie laugh I'd ever heard. They jumped back down, dropping whatever it was they were holding, and ran toward the window of the trailer as if to peek in. My cousin was inside holding the baby. I ran to the window to look, and to my amazement, the person had already disappeared. I ran inside and told my cousin that whoever it was, they were gone. Needless to say, we didn't sleep well for the rest of the night. The next morning, I went outside and looked at the window area where I'd last seen them. I looked at the ground and saw bare footprints. However, these were not the footprints of an ordinary man. The best way I can describe them is as human footprints, but as if the person had grown claws of some sort. 
I went to the utility pole and found what they had been clutching the night before. It was my niece's tiny little shirt. It goes without saying we spent the next few days in the safety of my mother's home, off the reservation. I've always been big into making some money on the side, outside of my full-time job. I've at one point did all sorts of services, such as Uber, Postmates, and DoorDash. I had also heard good things about Instacart as well, so I decided I would give it a shot. One of my first Instacart orders that I picked up was a grocery haul delivery. I accepted the order because I also shopped at Aldi for my personal groceries anyway. I knew the store pretty well, and so it wouldn't take me very long to find the items for the order. I shopped the items, checked out, and then was on my way to the order's residence for delivery. When I arrived at the house, an older lady answered the door. She asked if I would be able to help her bring the groceries inside. Since she did have a rather large order, I obliged and helped her out. She was a very kind lady and thanked me for my help. She offered me a cup of tea. I didn't really want to, but the lady was really insisting, saying that it was her way of paying me back. I decided I would stay for just a little while. The old lady told me to wait on the couch in the living room while she went and made the tea. I sat there for a couple of seconds just looking around and taking in the living room. I really had to pee, though. I saw a bathroom at the end of the hallway, so I figured I would just go really quickly while she was making the tea. As I was about to enter the bathroom, I happened to glance into a room that I was walking by and stopped to take a better look. It was an odd room. There wasn't much at all. The walls were covered with drawings made from charcoal, I didn't know if these were some kind of satanic symbols or something else, but it was very weird. There were also tons of candles in this room. Weirdest of all, hanging from the wall were multiple handcuffs. I honestly had no idea what was going on in that room, especially since the old lady I met seemed very frail and gentle. Whether it was some sort of weird fetish or hobby or something deeper going on, I was a bit weirded out and uncomfortable. I didn't even end up going to the bathroom. I just wanted to leave the house. Heading back toward the living room, I saw the lady was still occupied in the kitchen, so I quietly opened up the front door and left without saying anything. As I drove away, I took one last look toward the home and saw the old lady now standing at the front window, staring at me with this dead-eyed stare. I didn't bother calling anyone or explaining my visit to the old lady's home. I really didn't know what I would tell them, other than seeing an odd room. From that day forward, though, I didn't particularly feel like entering anybody else's home to help out with their groceries. A couple of years back, my fiancé and I officially moved in together and got our first home. We were aware the neighborhood we were moving to was not the greatest neighborhood, but our house was recently remodeled and it fit our budget. It became apparent to us within the first couple of weeks of living there that our neighbors were quite odd to say the least. Sometimes we would see the owners out in the yard. The men and women who we would see often didn't seem very friendly. Whenever we tried starting a conversation or even some small talk with them, they spoke very quickly and acted like they didn't want us to bother them in any way. They seemed intent on sticking to themselves and not making any signs of friendliness, as neighbors often do. It wasn't the biggest deal in the world, but there were some other things beside that that were going on as well. Multiple times, we would see tons of different cars in the driveway and different people coming either in or out of the neighbor's home. 
We never bothered to ask, but there was an abnormal amount of activity going on, as if they rented out parts of their house on Airbnb or something. One of those nights, while there were some more cars and people there that we had never seen before, something strange happened in the evening, close to sunset. My fiancé and I were just relaxing on our back patio when a man we'd never met before walked over to the fence between our yards. Somewhat surprisingly, he engaged in conversation with us. Normally, nobody from next door would even acknowledge we were existing outside. It was odd to have somebody initiating conversation now. The conversation with this taller man was pretty normal at first. We were talking about how our day had been, and the beautiful weather that we had earlier that day, and various other things. The man never mentioned about how he knew our neighbors, or where he was from. Eventually, the quick conversation began to come to a close. The part which seemed odd to us was that before leaving, he mentioned many, many times how beautiful our home was, and what a lovely couple we were. That night, we were drawn to our back window facing the backyard. There was light and noise out there. The same man we had talked to earlier was now sitting in our chair in the backyard. He was on the patio and started a fire in the fire pit. Shocked by the scene, we weren't sure if we should ignore him, see if he leaves at some point, or go out there and tell him to get off our property. I ended up opening the window and asking the man politely if he could put out the fire and go away. He responded by yelling that we should come down and sit there with him. He wanted to get to know us better. Obviously, we did not go out there and sit with him. About 15 minutes later, he left on his own, putting out the fire. As the night went on, my fiancé and I began getting ready for bed. We had finished brushing our teeth when we heard a knock downstairs at the back door. We looked at each other in dread, as we had a hunch of who it would be. Sure enough, we looked through the back window, and the tall fellow was standing outside the back door. He had this poker iron for the fire in one of his hands. His now crazy anger-filled face stared up at us, shouting to come down and start a fire. Moments later, he began tearing our outer thin screen door apart with that fire iron. We called the police, but by the time they arrived, the man had left our back door and driven away from our neighbor's home. The police ended up chatting with our neighbors once we explained the situation. The next morning, the man and woman who owned the home next door gave a quick apology for what happened, saying it would never occur again. They ended the conversation very abruptly and walked away as they so often did. They paid for fixing our screen door, thankfully. Our neighbors kept having multiple different cars and people at their home, but we never did get bothered like that again. We never again saw the tall man either, who had gotten angry with us for no reason. This happened back when I was a kid in the early 2000s. I remember it like it was yesterday, though. I think I was about 10, and I lived with my parents and two younger sisters at the time. We lived about 10 minutes away from a huge shopping mall. I went there many times as a child. One sunny Saturday morning, all five of us went down to the mall. The reason we were going is because my younger sister wanted to see some celebrity that was having a meet and greet or something. I don't remember exactly who it was or even what the situation was. All I know is that I wasn't really a fan. When we arrived, the mall was very busy. My mom and sister got in line where all the other girls were waiting. Me, my dad, and younger sister went to walk around the rest of the mall and wait for them to finish. My dad took us to the center of the mall, which had a large amusement park. We went to the arcade, played some games for a while. After some time of this, my mother and sister were still in line with the large crowd. My youngest sister was going on some little kid's ride. I was hungry, so my dad gave me some money to go and buy some food. I left the area and walked down some crowded hallways. 
and I was looking for pretzels specifically. I walked probably five minutes away as I struggled to find them. I was passing by hundreds of different people. I remember that sometime as I was walking, I felt a tap on my shoulder from behind. I looked back, and there was a man standing there that I didn't know. At first, I was very confused. I thought he may have mistaken me for somebody else. The man said that he had to talk to me and motioned for me to step to the side. I went a little off to the side, away from where everybody else was walking, in front of a random store. The man asked me what I was doing, walking around the mall all by myself. I told him I was going to get a pretzel, and that's when the man told me he would buy one for me. He asked me to go with him. Now, I knew better than this. I realized that this man was a total stranger, so I said no. Instead of continuing to go find the pretzels on my own, I started to walk back to my dad. I remember that at first, the man started to walk after me, which made me pretty nervous. This didn't last long, though. I was able to quickly blend in with the large crowd by moving fast, and I lost the guy pretty easily. He didn't really seem to attempt to chase after me either. He gave up, and I was able to quickly walk back over to find my parents. My mom and younger sister were still in line, and my dad and youngest sister were still on the ride. I waited for my dad and sister. I told my dad what happened when the ride was over, and the three of us went to get pretzels together. I was looking out for the man who had approached me, but I did not see him. Afterwards, we found a table near where my mom and sister were, and we sat down there. After a while, they were finally done. I remember that after that, we all went someplace else. I can't remember where exactly. When we were going to leave, we were approaching the hallway that I had walked down where the guy had approached me before. The area was much more clear now, and there were multiple police officers about, as if something had happened. We all wondered about it, but ended up just walking right past and going away. I remember later that day when we got home, my parents said that the police activity was caused by an attempted child grabbing. After learning a man was arrested and seeing it was near where that man had approached me earlier, I figured it had to be the same guy. It really creeps me out for sure, but I also feel very lucky that I just walked away from the guy when he talked to me. I'm happy the man was not able to successfully grab anybody. My family timeshares a cabin on a lake, and we go there about once a month. We have a pretty large family, and oftentimes we invite up friends or significant others with us as well. Because of how crowded the sleeping situation can get inside the small cabin, a group of us, normally the younger adults, will pitch a tent outside to sleep in. The best spot for the tent to be set up is on the sandy beachfront right by the water, since it's softer than the yard. One weekend toward the end of July, there were many people staying at the cabin that weekend. It was a perfect night outside, so a group of four had decided to sleep outdoors in the tent. The group included my older brother, his girlfriend, my younger brother, and me. That night, I was woken up to the sound of a boat engine out on the lake. Sometimes, fishermen would go out onto the lake in the middle of the night. They wouldn't have to deal with the daytime activities of jet skis and pontoons. The fishermen never came too close to anyone's property, though. This motor engine, although it was running quietly, was getting closer to our beach area where the tent was set up. My older brother had also been awoken by the noise of this boat, so we went out together to check out what was going on. Walking out onto our dock, we saw a fishing boat slowly drifting by, only about 15 to 20 feet away from our dock. The moonlight revealed that the boat was seemingly empty. We watched confused as the boat drifted into our neighbor beach area. Both my brother and I stood frozen on the dock, not knowing what to think. What were we seeing? The silence of the night was broken 
By our neighbor's dogs barking, our two dogs joined in on the barking as well. My brother and I ran down the dock toward the beach. We were about to start walking up the hill towards our cabin when a figure emerged from the darkness of my neighbor's yard. The person had a black wetsuit on and some type of mask with goggles covering their face. Our neighbor's cabin and ours are close by each other. We saw the figure run past us, about 90 feet away at most. They entered the boat and drove away back out onto the lake. They looked toward my brother and I standing on the beach and our tent as they drove away. We found out the next day our neighbor's cabin had been broken into, but their dog scared the person away before anything happened or anything was taken. It was quite an eerie experience, especially camping in the middle of all that action in the night. Seeing that empty boat drifting and the figure escaping, I don't think the person in the black wetsuit knew that we were camping out on the beach though. Otherwise, I don't think they would have come so close with their boat. Our family still goes out to that cabin fairly often, and we haven't seen the boat or the figure in the wetsuit ever again. Our parents use it as a bit of a scary story, exaggerating a bit to spook people before they go and sleep on the tent in front of the beach. This happened back when I was a child. I think I was nine years old if I'm remembering correctly. One night during the summertime, I was sleeping in my bedroom, which I had all to myself. I was awoken in the middle of the night because there was a big thunderstorm going on. I remember it was something like two o'clock in the morning. I was a bit scared of big storms at that age, and I knew I wouldn't be able to fall back asleep right away. I got out of bed and turned on the light, then got back in and grabbed my Nintendo DS from my bedside table. I turned it on, and that's about when the light suddenly turned off. I realized that we had lost power. My digital clock turned off as well, and everything became really quiet. I could just hear the rain pouring outside, and the rest of the storm. I went underneath my covers and started playing some games on my DS. My plan was to play games until I finally got sleepy again, or it just stopped storming. I knew that my parents and siblings were all asleep, and I didn't want to wake anybody up. I hoped the power would come back on soon. Luckily, my DS had good battery life. I was playing for quite a while, and hearing the storm going on in the background. At one point, it sounded like things were lightening up, so I wanted to look out the window and see what was going on for myself. I lifted up the blanket I was hiding under and looked over to the window. When I did, though, I was surprised to see that there was someone standing out there, a woman. I didn't know who the woman at my window was. The woman was just standing right there, staring at me. I quickly covered myself back up with the blanket. I had no idea where she came from or how long she had been standing there. I don't actually have a great memory of what she looked like either. I just know that seeing her really scared me. While I was under the blanket on my bed, I was too scared to get up and leave. I just stayed there. After a short time, I heard the woman say something to me, but I couldn't quite make it out. Then there was a slight knock on my window. I ignored it. I was too scared to move. After a few minutes, though, I didn't hear anything more. I gathered up some courage and looked again. When I did, not only was the woman still standing there, she was staring at me unblinking. I quickly got up this time and ran away. I left my bedroom and went down the hallway to my parents' room. I woke them up and told them what was going on. By the time my parents made it back to my bedroom, of course the woman was already gone. My dad went outside and searched the yard, but said she must have left already. Luckily, the power came back on a short time later, and the storm ended. This remains one of the scariest moments of my life. I never found out who the woman was, or what she was doing there. 
I mean, it's pretty creepy to stare into a kid's bedroom doing a thunderstorm in the middle of the night. I'm just glad that she never returned. When I was younger, I worked at a dollar store called Family Dollar. It was one of my first jobs, and I was 17 years old. I lived at home during this time with my parents, in a neighborhood that was really close by to my work. I could go there just by taking a few sidewalks. It took maybe 10 minutes or so. Because of this, most of the time I would walk to work and back. I didn't have a car yet anyway. One time, I worked until 9 o'clock at night. It had been a pretty typical shift up to that point. I clocked out and left. When I was done, I began walking home along the quiet streets. The street directly in front of the family dollar was somewhat busy during the day, but not really at night. The roads behind the family dollar were mostly residential and usually very quiet. We lived just a few blocks behind it. Normally, when I would walk home, there would be nobody else on the sidewalk at all. This night, though, there was a man following me. I first noticed him about two minutes into the walk. I heard footsteps a ways back and looked over my shoulder. I saw a man walking behind me. Actually, I recognized him. He'd been inside of the dollar store earlier in the day. In fact, he had come to my register where I was a cashier. Except this guy had been there much earlier. I'm talking five hours ago, and I hadn't seen him come back inside the store or anything since then. This seemed sort of strange to me. I kept walking, and when I turned to go down another street, he followed me. I was beginning to get nervous. I really wasn't that far away from home, so this was becoming more and more of a problem. As soon as I reached my street, I turned to go down it, and hoped the man would not do the same. Of course he did. I couldn't go to my house now. I went to the end of the street, and then started to head for the street behind my house. The man followed me the entire time. After walking down that street, I quickly turned a corner. The man was not right behind me or anything, so it would take him probably 20 seconds to reach the corner and be able to see me. In the short time he couldn't do so, I ran into a neighbor's yard and cut into their backyard. After going behind their house, I cut through a couple more yards, and then I was in my own backyard. I quickly went around to my house and went inside. I was out of breath from running, and my heart was racing from the experience. I felt much better now that I was safe, though. I watched out the windows for a while to see if the man would walk past. To my surprise, I did end up seeing him walking down the street. I didn't think that was a coincidence at all. Luckily, he didn't go into our yard or anything. I was confident that he did not know where I lived. I told my parents about it, and they told me that I should drive to work next time. My mom didn't need to use her car during the time of my next shift, and said that I could use it instead. Even though it would take less than a minute to drive there, I did so anyway. The next time I worked was two days later. I once again worked another shift that ended around 9 o'clock at night. During that time I was working as a cashier, and a few hours into the shift everything was pretty quiet. That was when I happened to look over and noticed the man who had followed me home entering the store. When I saw him, I got real nervous. I didn't know what he was going to do. The man went into some random aisle and then disappeared from my sight. I was dreading having to ring him up when he checked out. I tried my best to ignore it and tried to think about other things. After a while, I noticed the man leaving. He did not buy anything and did not check out either. I felt relieved. For the rest of my shift, I didn't see him. On this night, when I got off, I left the store and went to my mom's car in the parking lot. When I got inside, I started up the engine and began leaving. When I was driving out of the lot, I saw lights turn on from another car. That one started to leave. Instantly, I got paranoid. I was worried this was the same man. When I took a left and headed towards my street, the car behind me also took a left. 
I drove to my street and drove onto it, and so did the car behind me. I just knew it was the exact same guy as before. I drove past my house and went to the street behind me once again. This time, though, I left that street and started driving to try and find the local police station. I had to look up directions, but was able to make it there within 10 minutes. When I pulled into the parking lot, the car behind me was still there, but did not pull in after me. I parked and went into the police station and reported everything. Of course, I had no proof the person in the car behind me was the same man from before, but I had more than a hunch. Unfortunately, I did not get the license plate. I couldn't see because it was so dark. I was hoping the police would be able to do something. I didn't want to get followed home from work again. After speaking with the police, I called my parents and told them about what happened. Then I went home. The next time I worked, I was really worried that I would be followed again or see the man or something. I knew to call the police if I noticed him again, though. When I got to work, I told my co-worker about the story, and surprisingly, my co-worker Tori seemed to know the man. Tori was older than me and worked full-time at the store. When I described the man, she said it sounded a lot like a guy that she kind of knew. She told me he was a creep and had a mutual friend with her. After work that night, I was extremely careful. I looked all around for the man. Tori even walked with me to my car. Luckily, I was not followed home again. The next time I worked after that was several nights later. When I got to work, Tori was working as well. She told me the man she knew, the same man who had followed me, had been arrested. Apparently, he was driving with drugs in his car and led the police on a high-speed chase for a while. When I saw a picture of him, I confirmed it was the very same man. That was a huge relief to me. I went to the police after work and told them it was the same guy who'd followed me. This was a long time ago now, but I'll never forget it. I only worked at the Family Dollar for a few months and then quit. Looking back, that was definitely the scariest thing to ever happen to me. My mom was a single parent of three kids. We were pretty poor, so she worked pretty much 24-7. This meant that as kids, my siblings and I spent a lot of time home alone. Well, this story happened when I was 14, at the very start of summer. My older sister had moved out by then, and my little brother got sent to stay with my grandpa for the summer. This meant I was home alone from about 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. every weekday. I didn't really mind too much though. I spent most of that time playing Neopets or watching awful daytime TV. Well, one day, I had not long woken up and my mom had gone to work hours earlier. It was around 12 p.m. or so. I got up to make some food, let my dog outside, and settled down on my bed to eat a bit. I remember watching Rock of Love and remember exactly the bit of show I was watching too when this happened, even though it happened so many years ago. As I was sitting there watching, I heard a loud smack on my window. My window was a double window that needed two blinds, two curtains, etc. This meant there was a tiny gap where you could see through the very middle of them, where they didn't quite touch together. I saw a shadow along with that sound. I also heard some logs falling down. Outside my window, there was a pile of firewood for the winter. I got up and walked over thinking perhaps a branch or something had smacked against it, and that's when I saw it. A huge handprint left on my window right where the tiny gap was between my blinds. I freaked the fuck out. I couldn't even breathe. I was so scared. I called 911 and then my next door neighbor, who was a family friend. He ran over as soon as I said what happened, and he found the guy there still. A man in his mid-forties, sprinting out of my backyard into the street ahead. My neighbor tried to keep him there until the police arrived. When they got there, I told them what happened. They looked into the guy to see if he had a past, but nothing seemingly came up. He had been dating and living with another neighbor three doors down from my house for a few months. When asked what he was doing at my window, he told us he was never there. He was just looking for something. I don't remember his exact excuse. 
I just remember him saying it happened to be in my backyard. The police got a statement from him, and the neighbor who caught him and myself thought it would help to get him put away or something. I know, it's stupid, but I was a teen. I didn't know any better. They just let him go and didn't do anything. I waited to hear from them regarding next steps we could take, but I never got another reply. From then on, my anxiety was awful. I had motion lights set up outside my window as well, making sure I was never sleeping alone too. But it wasn't enough. I could never rest. Now I felt like I was constantly being watched everywhere. Who knows, maybe I could have been. How did this guy know I would be home alone? What did he want to find me doing? I felt so unsafe. Fast forward two months later. I'm staying with my best friend who lived across the street from me, and we were both in the shower. We saw a shadow walk up to the bathroom window. It was glazed over, so you couldn't see anything properly. I wiped off some of the steam, and who do I see? That guy from my window the other time, running away from the bathroom as I popped it open. I told my friend who it was, and we both freaked out together. We called the cops again, and again they did nothing. Worst part was, no one even believed me, minus the guy who'd found him the first time. My mom told me I was too fat for a guy to want to creep on me, and that I was just being dramatic. Nothing happened to the guy. He did this multiple times after, and I have to wonder how many others he did it to as well. The woman he was living with had a very young daughter at the time too. It still haunts me, though I guess it shouldn't. It just scares me. We can go on with our lives, and someone could be watching and waiting to prey on us, and we would never know. What would he have done that night if he hadn't accidentally knocked the firewood logs over? I'll never know. First, I guess I should say that when I was growing up, my mom had a lot of undiagnosed mental health issues. One of the more minor things she suffered from was extreme anxiety and social awkwardness, but in this case, it had a significant impact on what would come. I must have been around the age of 8 to 10 years old. I can't remember exactly. We lived in a very small town in the north of Scotland, which also happened to be only a mile or so away from a sort of spiritual retreat that was fairly well known. And because we had this spiritual place so close to us, we would get a lot of, shall we say, weird people coming into town. Now I don't mean to suggest that spiritualness always equals weirdness, but the reality is it did attract a lot of strange people to the area. One day, I, my mom, and my little brother went up the high street to get some groceries, just a usual Friday afternoon. Outside the grocery store, just before making our way home, there was this guy with a large dog. Off the top of my head, I can't remember what breed it was, but it was one of those huge ones with the beautiful pure white fluffy fur. My brother and I were fascinated by it. The guy got to chatting with my mom for what seemed like an eternity. Eventually, she managed to get him to stop bothering her, and we started walking home. The guy with the dog had this van. Instead of just saying goodbye and going on his way, he shoved his dog in the back and proceeded to drive behind us at a pace slower than we were walking at. When we got home, he parked right outside our front door. When we got in, my mom shut the curtains and said to just ignore him. On Saturday morning, my brother and I got up early. When we peeked out the curtains, he was still there, standing with his dog right outside the wall to our garden and staring in through our living room window. It feels weird to even say this now, but honest to God, our mom made us turn off all the lights and crawl around so the guy would think we were not home. For the next two days, he stayed outside our house, coming up to our door, banging on it. When he got no response, he would come to the living room window and slam on that, shouting he knew we were home. He just wanted to be friends. Lots of things like that. Eventually, after almost a week of this, he finally fucked off. I know how weird it is now that my mom didn't just call the police or a friend for help, but I guess I can forgive her for suffering mental health issues at the time. As for the guy though, I have no idea what he was thinking doing all that shit.
This happened when I was around 12 years old. It was in the middle of the night at my home. My dad would work the graveyard shift at work. Since it was the weekend, I had stayed up most of the night. It was somewhere between midnight and 1am. My dad had told me to lock the doors and go to sleep, which I had done. I went to my room and finally fell to bed. After I went to my room, I had only slept for about an hour though. At around 2am, I was suddenly woken up to the sound of knocking on my back door. It scared me wide awake. After taking a few moments to process what I'd just heard, I decided it was probably just my dad knocking on the door. Maybe he'd forgotten something. Being mentally exhausted, I knew he had a house key on him. I told myself he'd just unlock the door on his own eventually. But the knocking continued. It was pretty creepy. Next thing I knew, the knocking had suddenly stopped. Then it started again at a different location. Someone was knocking on the window to my kitchen. I continued to try and assure myself it was just my dad. I didn't understand though. Why couldn't he just unlock the door himself? He always had the key on him. Thinking about this a bit more, I was starting to get pretty freaked out. I wasn't going to answer the door. If anything, my dad would eventually call me to open it for him. My phone was right next to me, but no such call ever came. The knocking started again at another window. I was terrified now, too scared to get up and check what was out there. The knocking would not stop. Next thing I know, it moved to the front door, and they began to slam at a harsher level too. That's when it hit me that I couldn't bring myself to move. I was frozen in fear. I couldn't bring myself to scream or talk or move any muscle. My heart was dropping as the knocking moved to a window closer and closer to my bedroom. My curtains were see-through. I couldn't do anything. I didn't know what I could do. I could only stay as my fear consumed me. I moved my eyes to the window. My heart skipped a beat when I saw a man peeking in through it, a tall man with a ski mask covering his face. I could hardly make out the details because it was so dark. His mask had some sort of skeleton design on it, and he tilted his head slightly as he noticed I'd seen him. I tried to say anything, but my words choked in my throat. I closed my eyes hard and started whispering to myself that it was not real over and over again. I opened my eyes. No one was there. I breathed a sigh of relief until I heard a loud whisper from outside. Open up or I'll cut you. Everything suddenly stopped. I could finally move again, but I couldn't really sleep anymore that night. It didn't feel like a dream. Everything felt so real. I don't know what happened, but I pray I'll never have to experience that again. It was one of the most frightening moments in my life I've ever dealt with. I couldn't find any trace of the guy after though. I was home alone that day too, so nobody could back me up. The following morning, I asked my dad when he came back from work if he'd come back earlier that day and knocked on my doors and windows. Of course, he did not. My family used to move around a whole lot. That meant that when I was younger, I was almost always changing schools. It got to be very hard to make friends, not only because of all the moving, but because I always expected to be leaving again very soon. And that kept me from wanting to form new attachments. We moved so often it seemed futile. I mostly just kept to myself whenever I entered a new school. Well, of course, anyone who's been to school knows exactly how the loners are treated especially in middle school. That was where I was in my education when this story takes place. My family had just moved to a semi-rural area. I remember this being the worst time in my life, and I still consider it to be that way, honestly. I was in the seventh grade, and I remember this year I turned 13. I had always been a bit of a small kid, and the fact that I was so quiet and a loner just made this whole thing worse on me. The bullying started pretty early, and it got pretty nasty too. In fact, it had gotten so bad I would try to make myself sick in the morning to avoid going to school. I would wear wet socks to bed or put dirty things in my mouth. Back then, we actually thought something like that could make you sick. It was constant name-calling. Kids would always try to force me into fights with them. 
I never wanted to fight, and there was never any reason. I remember once these two bullies held me, while another burst a water balloon on me. Then they went around joking and telling everyone I had a wet dream. It was humiliating, just being at that school. The worst part is that the teachers never did anything about it. It happened on the bus, too. A few of the guys who gave me a hard time at school were on the same bus as me, and lived in the same general area I did. Fortunately, I lived 45 minutes away and out in the country, so being home was the best thing for me. I would never encounter anyone else who tormented me way out there. Summer vacation because of this was my favorite time of year. In that particular summer, it was even more welcome than before. I was able to just be home and not have to deal with the constant torment that was visited upon me. One of my favorite things to do was go out exploring into the woods. I would do that maybe a few times a week during the summer. There were a lot of woods in the area, so I was never short of spaces to explore. Sometime in the middle of the summer, I was out exploring in an area I'd never been in before. I'd come across some berry bushes and was surprised to find a good haul of blackberries. I decided I would pick them and bring some home, because they were pretty good actually. As I was walking along, I found a dead squirrel. It was obvious the squirrel had been shot and just left there to die. Whoever had shot it was doing it for fun, not for food. I found a bird in a similar condition. It was heartbreaking to see any of this. I wondered why people like to kill animals for fun. As I was out hiking this new area, I began to hear what sounded like footfalls every now and then. I'd never encountered any other people when I was out exploring before. I'd only once in a while come across an animal that wasn't a bird or a squirrel even, but I'd never seen anything dangerous out here. The footfalls I was hearing seemed like there was something bigger. I didn't think there were things like dangerous cats or anything like that around, but I did get a bit concerned when I heard what sounded like someone laughing. Then I knew if I had heard this correctly, there was a person out here in the woods following me. My first thought was I was about to get in trouble for trespassing. I didn't know who owned the land I was exploring on, so I began to get a little bit scared. I decided to go back towards my house, or at least try to find a road to walk along. I went off and kept hearing sounds that indicated someone was in the woods following me. I kept looking around, trying to see who it could be, but whenever I looked in the direction of the noises, they'd stop immediately, and I wouldn't see anything. Then I'd hear the laughing begin again. When I turned around to face it the last time, my heart froze in my chest. I was terrified. I was looking at a kid named Billy, one of my worst bullies in school. He was with a bully friend of his, Kyle, and the scariest thing of all was that both of them had rifles. They emerged from behind the trees to face me. I didn't know what to do. I was terrified at the scary looks on their faces. I thought about those dead animals. I was positive it was these two that had killed them. Kids my age shouldn't be out in the woods with rifles. I'm sorry. Being 13 and doing that sort of thing is just wrong. The proof I have of this? Both of them pointed their rifles at me right away. Billy taunted me, calling me horrible names and racial slurs. Then they said I was dead. I turned around to run. As soon as I did, I heard a gunshot ring out. I didn't feel anything, so I know I didn't get shot myself. But needless to say, I was terrified. I fell down to the ground. Kyle and Billy ran up to me and pointed their rifles at me. They called me names and made fun of me because I was scared. I didn't want to move. I just laid there on the ground, hearing their insults and being terrified. It was the worst feeling I'd ever had in my life. Then the most amazing thing happened. Billy, what the fuck are you doing? I heard a man's voice call out. Oh, uh, hey, Dad. We were just playing around, weren't we? He asked me. He had a look in his eye that said he would shoot me if I didn't agree. They were hunting me, I told Billy's dad. A huge man came up and grabbed the rifle out of Billy's hand and put it on the ground. He said four words I'll never forget. Cut me a switch. Billy looked terrified. He took out his pocket knife and cut a switch from a bush or something. He handed it to his dad, and his dad began to beat him with the switch in front of all of us. Billy was reduced to tears, and I could tell Kyle was scared he would be next, too. Lucky for him, Billy's dad deigned not to punish him. Help him up. 
the dad demanded, and Billy did as he was told. You apologize right now. Billy apologized, and the dad asked me if I was all right. I told him I was fine. He grabbed the rifle in one hand and Billy with the other, and he dragged the two of them off. I think Billy was going to be a lot worse for wear when he got home with his dad. Although my story does have a fortunate ending, it was a terrifying experience. Bullies are scary to begin with, but bullies willing to kill are much worse. Billy didn't bother me again after that. He just gave me horrible looks in school, but he never talked to me from then on. A lot of neighborhoods have quote-unquote haunted houses in them. You know the exact kind I mean. Houses that are for some reason abandoned and boarded up for a long time. No one really seems to know why, so all the children just decide the house must be haunted or something. The older kids make up weird stories about it, just in order to scare their siblings and their friends. It's always just a bunch of bullcrap, but it becomes legend with the kids in the neighborhood. My neighborhood had something even better than that. You see, we had this old abandoned hospital. That's all I really knew about it, really. I knew it had been abandoned for a very long time. The kids in the neighborhood all claimed it was a mental hospital, but I never really verified that for sure. We had this little town legend about it, at least amongst us kids. So the story went that this was a mental hospital, but when they closed it down, the patients were released back into society. One of the patients, a man the kids called Lucky, not the cleverest nickname, but were kids after all, considered the place to be his home and returned to living in it years afterward. Supposedly, this man lived in the basement and would try to kill anyone who ever entered his home. The kids in the neighborhood would always dare each other to break in and spend time in that old hospital. No one would ever actually do it, though. I'd been dared before myself. The closest I'd ever gotten was climbing over the gate. Once I was on the other side, though, I'm not too proud to admit I chickened out immediately and hopped back over. There was one kid in the neighborhood that did take the dare completely. So, this story is not a first-hand account of what happened inside. It almost scared me to death not knowing what really happened to him. I was a high school freshman on Halloween. A bunch of us headed down to the hospital to go about the usual daring. Some of us would go right up to the gate, begin to climb over, and then chicken out right away. One kid, though, that I didn't really know well named Tom was teasing us all mercilessly for being such cowards. He kept telling us that the stories of Lucky were just a bunch of baloney, and we were dumb for being so scared. About six of us had all chickened out and were being teased by this guy. We'd had enough of his crap. We told Tom that unless he was willing to put his money where his mouth was, he needed to shut the hell up. We were wrong in assuming that Tom was going to chicken out like us, though. He readily accepted our challenge and began to climb over the gate. He climbed over easily and jumped down on the other side. Then he waved at us and walked over to the door of the hospital. He actually tried to open the door as well. That was more than any of us had ever done before. It didn't work though. The door was locked. This actually gave Tom the chance to back out, but he didn't. After looking around for a bit, he found a large rock and used it to shatter one of the windows. We all got worried, of course. We thought the noise would attract somebody to the site, but that didn't happen. Tom broke the glass out of the basement window and then carefully lowered himself inside and out of sight. We were all pretty shocked at this point and a bit ashamed of ourselves as well. The shame that we felt, though, in no way compared to the paranoia that settled in on us as we waited for Tom to come back out. At first, we were just impressed he'd even gone in. Then, we were more impressed that he was staying in there for quite a while. And that feeling of being impressed, though, began to fade into worry. Longer and longer, Tom still did not come back out of the hospital. It was bad enough when an hour had passed, even worse when two hours had passed, and absolutely dreadful when nearly four hours had passed by and not a single peep from Tom. It really began to bug us. 
We weren't sure why he hadn't come back out yet, but we were definitely speculating on it. Our first thought was that he was taking his time to try and scare us. The worst thought, and the one that became more and more realistic to us kids as time went on, was that Tom must have really come across lucky, and he must have been unhappy to have someone invading his home. Tom's disappearance put us all in a bad place. We weren't supposed to be hanging out here. If he didn't come back, we were going to have to go to our parents or the police, and neither of those choices were going to be easy. When Tom still didn't emerge for six hours, we went directly to the police. Maybe we should have gone to our parents first in hindsight, because when the cops called our parents out of the blue, the situation got even worse. I got chewed out in front of all the cops and all the other parents as well. While the chewing out was quite bad, what happened when the cops went to the hospital to look for Tom was much worse. They searched the entirety of the property, the basement, the rooms, the hallways, everything. There was not a single trace of Tom or anybody else. The police figured he must have just exited the building somewhere else and left us waiting on the outside for him, although Tom still hadn't returned home yet. The police told his parents he was probably just playing out this prank, but Tom didn't return that night, nor did he return the next day. He didn't return the next week. Search parties looked for him throughout the town, but he wasn't there. The hospital was searched more than once, and nothing was found. No Tom, no Lucky, no indication other than the window that Tom broke that anybody had ever been there at all. Posters with Tom's picture were put up in the post office and in stores, but he never showed up. This happened in the 70s, and to this day, I have no idea what happened that night. Tom was never found. The guilt I've felt throughout the years is pretty bad, but not nearly as bad as the wondering. I never saw Tom again. I don't know what happened to him when he went into that abandoned hospital. I recently ran into an old co-worker from our time we worked at a sandwich shop in the truck stop. We chatted for a while before he had to leave, but I started thinking about my stint at that place, specifically the creepy sandwich guy. In college, I worked some overnights at that truck stop. It was a pretty safe place in a smaller town, and there had only been three incidents in the four years the place had been open before I got hired. One, a trucker got robbed. One, a group of ladies arrested for servicing the truckers. And one overdose. I was never really worried, even though my co-worker seemed a little bit concerned that I was a young girl working overnights. Especially at a truck stop in particular, where there was only one other employee in the entire place. Usually, it was really slow, though. Most of the time, I'd simply get three or four truckers coming in within the first hour. A couple of people would come in with the munchies and order three dozen cookies at one time, but usually it was around one person an hour, if that. And that meant most of the time I'd spend about three hours cleaning ovens, finishing dishes, deep cleaning the lobby, that sort of miscellaneous thing. I'd spend whatever leftover time in between the customers coming doing my homework. And the overnight boss on the other side, the gas station side, was pretty cool as long as everything was cleaned and temped regularly. A few weeks before I inevitably left this place behind, a guy came in about 20 minutes before my shift was set to end. It was around 5 a.m. at this point. My co-worker had arrived earlier, so we could fill out some paperwork he had to get done soon. He was sitting in the back office already because of this. I started to make this particular customer sandwich, making a bit of small chit-chat like usual. At first, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. He told me he was driving from New York to Wisconsin and asked me a bit about how my night had been. Nothing crazy so far. I wrapped up his sub, rang it up for him, and even threw in a small discount for him since he seemed nice. I was just happy I was getting ready to go home for a few hours of sleep before I had to head off to a long day of college classes. When I went to take his change is when things went wrong. He dropped the coins in my hand, but suddenly, he grabbed my wrist tight. The next thing I knew, I was flipping over the side of the counter onto the floor. He had yanked me across and still had a firm grip on my wrist. 
he began to wrap his hands around my throat. Thank God my co-worker was there. The manager on the other side had slipped into the bathroom, so to this guy's knowledge, I was the only person there at the moment. My co-worker, while filling out his papers, happened to look up at the cameras and see the man attacking me. He was bolting out of the back just seconds after I hit the ground, and before I knew what was going on, he had chased the man outside. He didn't pursue him far, afraid that someone else might be nearby who would come after me as well. He ran back inside, locked the door to our side of the store, and shouted for the manager to call the police. The cops came. They searched the area and watched the security photos, but nothing ever came from it. The guy disappeared completely, and I never heard anything about him. I put in my two weeks notice the following day, after my nerves had calmed down a bit. I was switched around so I worked during the day around my classes for my last few days. They made it a policy as well that two people were to be working both sides of the truck stop on overnights from that point on. I still live about half an hour from there, and honestly, I haven't gone back since that last day. That memory is still fresh in my mind, even eight years later. So this happened about a year ago, and it's still pretty freaky. For context, my friend and I are both 22 and female. My friend Anna and I were bored one weekend and decided to go to a popular beach to take some pictures and just mess around together. We took pictures and had a pretty lovely day overall. On the way back though, we were starving, so we decided to stop at a McDonald's in the beach town. This town is really, really famous and nice. Lots of celebrities live there and it's quite scenic. There's also a super famous restaurant right up the highway on the beach that's known for rich people going. The McDonald's was directly across the street from that restaurant. Since so many famous people went to this restaurant and it was on a pretty busy road already, most of them had drivers that took them there, usually in big black Escalades. The drivers would hang out in the parking lot of that McDonald's while their bosses ate across the street. Anna and I didn't really know this at the time. We just wanted a McFlurry. We go to the McDonald's and right when we get out of the car, she starts acting really weird. She triple checks the car doors are locked and grabs her fancy camera to bring inside with her. When I ask her what's up, she said there's a group of drivers standing in front of the McDonald's smoking and staring at us and it was making her feel weird. I'm a pretty chill and trusting person, so I didn't really think that much of it. It's a busy place and a super nice town after all. Not particularly worried. We go in and there are a few other people in there about our age. We grab our food and sit at the table to eat. One of the drivers comes in and sits a few booths down with his back to the wall, right where he can see us. My back was to him, but Anna was getting really creeped out and wanted to leave. He didn't eat or order anything. He just sat there staring at us. Still though, like I said, this was a really crowded McDonald's in one of the nicest towns in Southern California, so I was feeling pretty safe. Living in South Central, you get used to the occasional creep. Still, Anna was freaked out, so I agreed to go. I had to run to the bathroom first though. It was one of those McDonald's where the counter and main dining room were one big room. Then there was a sort of hallway off to the side of the counter with more seating and a bathroom at the very end way in the back. There was also a door going outside right next to the bathrooms. The bathroom had only two stalls inside. I walked into the first one, not really paying attention to whether or not anyone else was in there. So I'm in there doing my thing when I hear the door open and I hear Anna call my name. At this point, I was very confused since she was supposed to be watching our things. Yeah? What's up? She calls out to me. Are you okay in there? Yeah, I'm just using the bathroom, I reply. She stood there in the doorway. After a second, I heard her leave, and I thought that was very weird. I walk out of the bathroom, only to see her waiting by the door with all of our stuff in her hands. I asked her what was going on, and why she'd come into the bathroom. She looked at me extremely panicked, and said we needed to leave right now. I was really confused at this point. We rushed out to the car and she started to explain what had happened. Turns out when I'd walked into the bathroom, 
that driver had followed me inside. I didn't remember hearing him come in. I just assumed someone had either been in the stall next to me already and was leaving, or had just come in to check their makeup or something. Honestly, I wasn't paying that much attention. He didn't close the stall door when he came in, so I wasn't aware he was still in the stall next to me. She had been on her phone, so she hadn't seen him follow me either. A young guy eating had noticed it, and gone up to my friend asking if we knew the man. Frantic, she told him we did not, and ran to check on me. He was hiding in the stall next to mine, with the stall door wide open, trying to peek underneath and not making a single sound. She came in and didn't see him at first, so she called my name to make sure I was okay. When the man realized someone else was now in there, he rushed out of the stall past her and disappeared. She was in shock and didn't know what to do other than grab our things and prepare to run. When we went to her car, the man was sitting in his big black car with tinted windows, parked right next to us, staring at our car. We sped off. When I got the full story, we called the McDonald's to let them know what happened. They didn't really care, of course. Then we called the non-emergency sheriff line to report it as well, which happened to be closed. Thank you, Malibu, for nothing. Eventually, my mom went full mama bear and threatened to blast it all over social media that they didn't take my report seriously. And we got a hold of someone at corporate from there on. They checked their cameras and saw the guy follow me in as well. A police report was made, so at least hopefully this thing never happens to anyone else again. I was around 16 years old when this happened to me. It was just me and my dad at our house, and since he was a businessman that traveled quite frequently, I was left home alone quite often. First of all, I'll do my best to describe to you the layout of my house so you can better understand the situation. It's a fairly small place, since it was just my father, my dog, and I living in there. There was a long hallway full of full-sized windows, separating my dad's room and mine. Our dog loved to look out of them, so we always kept them open enough for her to glance out of. I was in the last room at the end of the hallway. In between the two rooms was my bathroom and a spare room. Let's get right into it then. It was around 11 p.m. or so, when the worst night of my life began. My dad was passed out in bed after a really long day of work, and I was mindlessly dancing around my house getting ready for bed. I hopped into the shower, not knowing what was coming ahead. Of course, like a cringe-worthy horror movie, my dog suddenly started aggressively barking up a storm. I decided, of course, to go out and explore by myself. I headed to my room to throw some clothes on first, though while my dog was still shitting bricks. Months before, I'm not exactly sure how, I'd somehow managed to break my door handle. You didn't have to twist the knob to open it anymore. All it needed was a gentle push. I was scared shitless when, after just having managed to put a shirt on, my dog opened the door herself. I looked to see her in my room, while in the midst of barking. That's when I looked out and saw it. There was only one window that had vision to the opening of my room. Just in the corner, I could see a person's face peeking in. Their face was so sinister, I can still see it in my mind years later. It was dark, so it took me a second to comprehend what I was seeing. When I finally realized, I screamed. My dad owned some guns, so when he heard me screaming, he ran out with his pistol loaded. He asked me what had happened and I could barely mutter what I'd just seen. He ran outside to see if the man was still waiting around. We stood out there for a minute, scanning the area. All of a sudden, a man was casually strolling towards us from the opposite direction, about a hundred yards away. I knew it was that very same man. I got that feeling in my stomach that you can never mistake. It was like he was trying to be so casual to cover up he had been there, by coming from a different direction. They couldn't fool us, though. You better stay the fuck away from my daughter. You see what I have here? You know what this does? He held up his gun. I could have sworn my dad was just going to shoot the man. The strange man brushed off these threats quite easily, though. 
and didn't seem very bothered. Fuck off, old man, he said, placing his hand in his pocket. My dad and I rushed back inside. The guy eventually went away, and it was almost like nothing had ever happened, but I still couldn't sleep a wink. I kept on thinking he was going to come back and hurt me because of those threats we'd made. We called the cops the next morning. They came and scoped out our house. The officer looked around trying to calm me down, but I was still pretty shaken up. He went out to the front yard, and that's when he noticed. In front of the windows in the long hallway, there were some small bushes, nothing much really. The cop from outside went to the window that had a view of where my room was. He tried to tell me the news without making me more upset, but he failed. There were indents in the dirt right in front of the window. That meant the guy knew exactly where he needed to look to see me. It seemed he had been there more than once as well, because there were various broken pieces of bush and divots in the ground. It turns out the guy was the nephew of my old neighbor. He had been staying there for months. Never arrested, never got in any trouble, barely got a slap on the wrist in the end. But at least he never bothered me after. How long had he been watching me exactly? I'll never know really. All I do know is I keep my door shut and I never keep the blinds open now. What is up guys, Blue Spooky here. Thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. If you liked the video, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. If you have any feedback for me as well, be sure to leave that in comments below the video. If you guys have a story you'd like to send in, or if you'd like to contact me for any reasons, there will be links to my social media in the description below the video, including my Facebook, Gmail, and Twitter accounts. Go ahead and send me a message on any of those, and I'll try to get to you as soon as possible. If you do decide to send in a story, please be sure to include in the tagline what the name of the story is if it has one, what type of story it is if it has one, and how you'd like to be credited in the description below the video. Please make sure to include as much detail as you feel comfortable with and try to use as much proper grammar as possible to make sure you have the highest chance of appearing in a future video. Overall, I think that's pretty much it for now, guys, so thank you so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a great day.